OK. Uh, great. So uh, hello. Uh, welcome to the class. Um, what we are doing today is we are talking about the second lecture on data streams. Um, and before I, I talk about that, just uh, uh, now an official announcement. So we will be having the information session for CS341 next week on Tuesday at 6 p.m. in the Gates Building second floor in the AI area. So it's kind of when you come up the stairs, just go straight, or when you come out of the elevator, you go kind of back. Um, and we will talk about how the class is being organized. Basically, the idea for this course is that you go and apply uh, skills that you learn in this class for a 10-week-long project course where we will provide data, project ideas, and we can provide the compute power. And you organize yourself into the groups of three, submit a project proposal, and then um, we will review the project proposals and then admit you into the class. Uh, the, the compute environment will be the, the Google Cloud. Uh, we provide the data mentorship and the problems. So it's a very, very fun class. Um, we admit usually between 10 to 15 groups, um, and there is uh, research that is done. There are research publications coming out of this, um, and it's a really good experience to kind of practice some of the things we do here theoretically, actually do them for real, and do like a machine learning data mining project for real. So. Um, if you'd like to learn more, you can go to cs341.stanford.edu. It's a last year's website, but there are, there are Google Slides posted on the website. Just scroll down enough, um, and you can go through the slides, and you'll get an idea of what we are looking for. The, the slides from last year, kind of the course is structured similarly. Just the project ideas will be different than this year, because every year we update. So um, that's the idea. Come on Tuesday at 6, at 6 p.m. to Gates uh, to learn more. OK, so now the lecture for today. We are talking about streams. And today we'll learn about four more new methods about how to do uh, stream processing. We'll start with what is called Bloom filters. And this is something, a method that is amazingly useful. Um, and and it, uh, it comes up in many different use cases. I'll talk about that. This is for filtering a data stream. In a sense, the goal is how do I select elements with property x? where x is some known property. Sounds easy, but it's super cool. Then we'll talk about how do I count dis distinct elements in the, in the stream with this uh, Flajolet-Martin algorithm. We'll talk about how do you estimate moments um, of a stream. Uh, and then I'll talk about frequent item sets and exponentially decaying windows, which is also very useful. So first, filtering a data stream. So abstractly, what we'd like is that we think of every element in the stream uh, as a tuple. And uh, given a set of keys s, we want to determine uh, if that element from the stream is in the set s. OK, this is what is called um, um, filtering, right? So an obvious solution would be that you have some dictionary, some hash table in which you store all the elements that are in s so that when the next element from the stream comes, you test it against the hash table. And, and if, if that thing is in the hash table, you emit it. And if it's not, you say, oh, it, I, I will filter it out, right? So but what if it happens that you don't have enough uh, space to store this hash table, right? Maybe you are processing millions of these types of filters in the same stream. Um, and let me give you an example where this is very realistic and it, and it, um, and it happens a lot, right? Here's one way how you could uh, implement a spam filter. Right? Imagine that each of us, each one of us has a set of good trusted email addresses. Right? And uh, maybe we know also 1 billion good uh, email addresses that we trust. Right? Um, now the question is, when an email comes in, we quickly want to check, is it from one of these 1 billion email addresses or not? Right? Or imagine that each one of us has, I don't know, 5,000 trusted email addresses. Right? And I'm Gmail, a new email comes in, I need to load your set of trusted email address at addresses compare that new incoming email to that set and say, should I let it through or do I declare it as spam? Right? And obviously, I cannot have um, a, a hash table of, uh, I don't know, a, a, a several thousand email addresses for every user. It's just too much. Right? So how would I do that? Another example, more, uh, more broadly, is this notion of published subscribe systems, where you are collecting lots of messages. Maybe you can think of this as uh, news articles. You could even think of this as events happening on a given website or in a given uh, application, maybe Facebook, maybe Pinterest. 
uh, and various people or various uh, sub-applications of your system express interests in certain subsets of keywords or certain subsets of messages. So now what you need to do is whenever a message arrives, you need to decide out of all the subscribers, um, uh, all the customers in some sense, who has subscribed to the messages of this type and then send the message to them very quickly. And, you know, think of the messages here as user activity on, on, on an app like Pinterest or Facebook and various applications subscribing or various subsystems subscribing to a subset of those messages. So we wanna, when a new message occurs, a new action on the site is taken, you want to very quickly go and say, who has subscribed to this? Who do I send it to? Right? That's, in general, what is called publish subscribe systems. You can think of content filtering, um, a, similar, um, a similar thing. Right? Um, and then um, the, um, uh, an, uh, another example I will, uh, I will talk about that also has this type of property is, for example, if you think you are doing advertising. And one thing in computational advertising is that you must not show the same ad to the same user multiple times, right? So what would this mean is that for every user, I want to keep track of what ads has this user seen so that when there is a new ad I may want to show them, I check have they seen this or not, right? So now every user has a set S of the ads they have already seen, and I need to check against that set to say, should I let this through or not? And that's a very realistic use case in, in, in many of the, of the companies uh, across the street, right? So how would I go do this, right? The idea, the first cut idea is the following, right? I have this set of keys, set of elements S that I want to filter, right? And the idea would be that I, want, I will create a bit array of uh, length of n bits, and I will set it to all zeros. And then I will have a hash function h that will take this key from the set s and it will uh, hash it to a range of 0 to n, right? I have a n bit iter b n bit bit array and I'm hashing into that uh, bit uh, bit array. So what I will do is for each member of the of the of the set s that I want to filter on, I will uh, I will hash it into this uh, n different buckets and I will set the bit in that bucket bucket to be equal to 1, right? So I take every element S in the set capital S, I compute the hash value, and then I set the corresponding bit in my bit array to, to be equal to 1. So what will I do now? This means that now when, a, when an uh, element from the stream uh, A arrives, what I will do is I will only output it if it hashes to a bit of value 1, right? So here, here is what I mean by that. When a new element a arrives, I say, oh, if it hashes to a bit that is set to 1, I will output it, otherwise I'll discard it. Okay? And this is already quite an interesting idea, right? I have this bit array. Um, I first hash the elements of the set into this bit array, set the values to 1. So now I uh, now the stream starts, and when I, I take an element from the stream, I see whether it hashes to a bit to a to an, uh, to, a, to an element of the bit vector that is set to 1, and if the answer is yes, I output it, right? So here is one way to think about it. I have my bit array here. Uh, the stream uh, items are coming in. I have this hash function. The hash function hashes my element into the bit vector. If the, if the uh, entry in the bit vector is set to 1, I output that item, and if, it's, uh, and if it hashes to an entry... Uh, in the bit vector that has value zero, I don't output that item, right? So in this case, if it lands on a one, I let it through, and it lands on a zero, I drop it, all right? Um, what is the observation? The observation is the following. If this element from the stream lands on a, on a bit value that is set to zero, I know for sure that it is not in S, right? I know for sure that I can throw it away. But if it lands in the entry with value 1, I actually don't know. It could be from the set S, or it could be just lucky that it got hashed into the same value as the entry from S. Okay? So what does this mean? This means that this will create false positives, but no false negatives. Right? It will let some elements through the stream, um, even though they shouldn't be let, but everything that should go through will be let through. Okay? You guys see, see this argument? Yes? All right. Great. So, right, so if the item is in S, we will for sure output it. We will for sure let it through. 
And if it's not in S, we may still uh, output it, right? So let's now look at how bad is the error of our approach, right? So let's say I have one billion email addresses and I have one gigabyte of memory. So this means I have eight billion bits, right? So now what do I do? I will take this one billion email addresses and I will hash them to eight billion buckets, right? So this means now that uh, um, if the email address is in S, then it surely hashes to a bucket that is uh, that has the value set to one. So I will always let it through, uh, which means I gen I have no false uh, negatives uh, negative type errors, right? But right, approximately one eighth of all the bits in my eight billion bit array will be set to one, right? Because I have one billion addresses and I hash them into eight billion buckets. So about one eighth, approximately of the bits will be set to one. So this means that when the new email addresses come through, um, about one eighth of them will be passed through even though they may not be in S, okay? The reason for that is because when a new email address comes, it's randomly hashed into the bucket, and if the email address is lucky to be hashed to a bucket with uh, value one, I will still let it through. And because about one eighth of the buckets are set to one, about one eighth of email addresses Will be will be will be let through regardless whether they should be or not. Okay, so that's the that's the argument. Now, this is kind of the heuristic computation um, uh, that kind of argues why do we get these false positives, right? Mistakes that we let through. Um, actually, it will be a bit less than one eighth of the bits that will be set to one. Um, and uh, let me now give you the argument um, why how do we correctly compute this one eighth, okay? So um, here is now a more accurate calculation on how many bits will be set to one. In reality, a few, a few less than one eighth of the bits will be set to one. And the reason for that is that even two email addresses from S, they can hash to the same bucket, right? So if every email address from S hashes to a different bucket, then one eighth of the buckets would be set to one, right? Because I have a billion over eight billion. But if some of the email addresses out of this eight billion, uh, sorry, out of this one billion hash into the same bucket, they collide, then the number of ones, number of buckets that are set to one will be a bit less than one eighth or a bit less than a billion. So let's compute how much less uh, um, or how many email address, uh, how many buckets precisely will be set to one, okay? So this will be now a more accurate analysis of the number of false positives or the number of bits that are set to one in our big, big uh, array of buckets, uh, right? So here is now abstractly, and then we'll see how this maps to our problem. Consider the following thing. When I'm throwing M darts into N equally likely targets, and what I ask is what is the probability that a target gets at least one dart, right? And why do I want this? Because then I'll be asking how many dart, how many, um, how many targets get at least one dart, right? How many buckets get at least one email address hashing to them, right? So in our case, targets will be buckets, bits in our bit array, and darts are the hash values of items, the hash values of email addresses, right? Uh, mapping back. So let's do this uh, analysis and, and derive what happens, right? So we have, again, M darts, M email addresses, and N targets, N buckets. And what we want to compute is what is the probability that the target gets at least one dart? And the way we do this is the following, right? We will say we have um, each, uh, we are throwing um, these darts kind of uniformly at random into targets, right? So this is the probability that a particular target is being hit by one dart. One minus that is the probability that, sa that our target um, does not, is not hit by a given dart, right? Our, our email address does not hash into a given bucket. Now, what we do, is to say, aha, uh -huh. so if I, if I raise that to the power of m, this means that none of the m um, tar darts that I threw hit my, my bucket. And one minus that is the probability that at least one, um, one, uh, one, one dart uh, hit the given target, right? This is that. And this should be clear how we, how we derive it. Now I'll do a little trick. What I will do is I will multiply and divide by n, 
right? I multiplied by n here and I divided by there. So I, this would cancel out and everything still stays, uh, stays the same, right? But the reason why I, why I did this is because it will allow me to kind of simplify this uh, intermediate or this middle term here. And what I will remember from high school is that the limit of 1 minus 1 over n raised to the power n, uh, that converges to 1 over e as n is set to infinity, right? When the number of uh, uh, tar targets that I get as that gets, uh, as that gets large. What this means is that I can take this expression and I can um, simplify it to 1 minus e raised to the power of m over n, where m is the number of uh, uh, darts and n is the number of targets, okay? So, um, and this approximation is especially accurate when n is large. And usually we have lots of targets, so it's a valid approximation, okay? So now, um, let's see how well, how well this works, right? So we are saying that the fraction of ones, fraction of bits, that are set to one, which means the fraction of targets that have received at least one dart, um, is, uh, is one minus, uh, one minus e over e raised to the power of minus m over n, where m is the number of uh, darts and n is the number of targets, right? So this means that the probability of a false positive is exactly that. Okay? So now, uh, let's go back to our example. We had, we said, uh, um, we said we have a billion email addresses and 8 billion bits, right? So uh, if I ask what fraction of ones are there in a bit array where I'm throwing uh, 1 billion um, email addresses into 8 billion buckets, it is 1 minus e raised to the power of minus 1 over 8. Uh, if I do that, I get 11.75%, right? Uh, which is very close to what my heuristic estimate was, was which is uh, 1 over 8, which is 12.5%, right? So our calculation um, is uh, is good, or our heuristic calculation early on was quite accurate, right? So this now tells me how many bits will be set to one, and this is now my probability of a false positive, right? If a random email address comes, we hash it into a bucket, and this is the probability that it lands into a bucket that has value one, so this is the probability we will let it through, even though we, have, we shouldn't have. Okay, so the number of mistakes we will make is about 10%, 11.7%, okay? Um, are there any questions so far? Good, everyone excited? Yes, okay. So, but this is not the, the, the super cool solution yet. This is a cool idea, but it's not super cool. So now we'll make it super cool, okay? So the way we'll do that is the following. We will use multiple hash functions, okay? So um, I'm still having this, uh, uh, set S of size M, I have the bit array of size uh, N, and now I will use multiple hash functions. I will use hash functions H1 to H sub K. And what I will do is the following. I will set all the entries in my bit array to be zero, and then I will take uh, every element in this set S, and I will use every hash function, and I will set the entry in the bit array to, to one, if any of these hash functions hashes that element s to value one, okay? So what does this mean is that I go over all the elements, I go over all the hash functions, and I take a given element, a given hash function, and I hash them all in the, into the same bit array, and I set the value one if they hash to the same value, okay? If they hash to that uh, bucket. Right? So this means that I'm using multiple hash functions and I'm just setting the entries of this bit array to one as I, as I scan through. Right? What is important to note is that we have a single array. Right? There is a single B, there is multiple S's, and then there is multiple hash functions. But we are just hashing into the same bit array. Right? And now what do I do at the runtime? At the run, runtime, when a street, when a stream element with entry uh, X arrives, I will do the following. I will say, here is my x. I will go over all hash functions, and I say, I will only let x through if for all the hash functions, this x hashes to a bit with value one, right? And if that is the case, then I output the element, okay? So the condition is that for every of the k hash functions, each hash function has to hash this element to an entry of value one, and if that is the case, 
right? For all of the hash functions, then I output the element, otherwise I discard it. Okay? That's the idea. So let's now do the analysis of how well does this work? Does it give us any benefit? Does it decrease the number of false positive? At the first sight, it seems like a bad idea, right? Here, we are using multiple hash functions, so more entries of this bit array B will be, will be set to one. Because we are hashing every entry k times, so now we are uh, increasing the number of bits that will be set to one by a factor of k, if you want to think of it that way, right? So in some sense, we are, we are polluting this, this bit array with more ones than what we did before. But why, does, why is this a good idea? It's because here we don't say, oh, at least one of the hash functions has to hash to the bucket one. We say all the hash functions have to hash you to the, to the bucket that is set to one for you to be let through, right? So here we are saying for all the hash functions, you, you should have the value of the bucket one, whatever the, ha the individual hash functions hash you, to, hash you to, okay? So that's the idea. So let's do now the analysis um, how, why, why does this work? Um, if there is a question, now is a good time to ask a question. If, um, if this is not clear. All right? So let's now see how, uh, why is this a better idea? Why does this work? Right, so before we said, what fraction of bit vectors uh, in bits, uh, bits in the bit vector B are set to one, right? As I mentioned before, now I'm, I'm in, in, sense, in some sense increasing the number of darts, right? Because now every element, every email address gets hashed k times. So I have k times m darts and still I have n targets, right? So my one minus e uh, function is now one minus e raised to the power of minus k times m times n, right? Because now the number of darts is k, k times n, right? So this means this would um, increase the number of entries that are set to one in our bit array, right? Uh, right, but as I mentioned before, we have k independent hash functions and we only let the element x through if for all the hash functions, the x hashes to a bucket with value one, right? So for every of the hash functions, you have to land in a one. So uh, what does this mean? This means the following, that the false, um, false positive probability is this is the fraction of buckets that are set to one, but it's not enough for one bucket to be set to one. For all of the k buckets that you hash to, they have to be set to one. So we are multiplying with a k here, okay? So that is great. So um, this is now the probability of a false positive, right? We got a multiplication with k here, but we also got another multiplication with the k outside. Because we say for all the buckets that you hash to, you have to hash to a value one. So, so that's where this second k comes from. This one comes because more entries are set to one because we are now hashing every email address k times. And this one set comes from this fact where we say every of the k uh, uh, hash values of a given element have to be set to one for the element to be let through. So if this is the probability of one uh, of hashing into a value into a bucket of value one. Now we have to be hashed into a bucket of value one k times, so it's raised to the power of k, okay? So now, uh, this is our new formula. Let's look at what does this formula do, All right? So for example, before we said, if you use one hash function, we computed, then the number of uh, false positive would be, would be 0.11, so 11%. If I use two hash functions, here is now the calculation, the error drops to 5%. Right? So using two hash functions is strictly better than using one hash function, right? So then the question is, what happens as we increase the number of hash functions? Does it mean that if I just keep increasing the number of hash functions, I will push down the error to be arbitrary low? And the answer is no, right? The, answer, the, the point is that there is this sweet number of hash functions where I will get the minimum error, right? So this, for this particular use case, with 1 billion email addresses and 8 billion buckets, um, the optimal number of hash functions to use is around six. And if I use six hash functions, then my error would be around 2%. So my false positive error would be around 2%. And remember, 
with one hash function, we were at 11%. And by just using multiple hash functions and the same storage cost, our error drops by a, in this case, by a factor of 5 to 2.16. Right? Um, right? So this is, this is now the probability of a false positive uh, plotted as a number of hash functions. And of course, why does the number, as I increase number of hash functions, why does the error not decrease? Because once I have a lot of hash functions, essentially the entire bit vector is set to 1, so everything will be let through. So that's why the error keeps increasing, right? So I want just the right kind of mixture between zeros and ones in my bit array so that the, the bit array is not porous enough to, to let mistakes through. And in the, the optimal value of k, the value of k where the, the error is the lowest, you can compute by dividing m with n and multiplying with a, a logarithm uh, of 2. If you do that for our case, you get 5.5, which we round to 6. And that's the, that's the method. So let me just uh, wrap up, right? So Bloom filters guarantees no false negatives, right? Everything that should be let through is let through, and they use a limited amount of memory. And they are very useful for uh, pre-processing before more expensive checks are being done. They are actually so simple that you can implement them on hardware. So there are hard, uh, hardware implementations and the computation can be parallelized, right? You can run all the hash functions uh, in parallel. And then the last thing you can ask yourself, is it better to have one big bit array B or is it better to have K small bit arrays B? And if you do that computation, it turns out it's the same. Right, it's essentially the same as you say, I run, I, I, I uh, throw in k times m darts and I require the, the item to be hashed into the k bucket set to value 1. Or you can say, I, I throw now m darts, but my bit array uh, is, uh, the, the, the width of it is not n, but n divided by k. And I still require uh, you to be hashed into the, into the k buckets with value 1. If you calculate the two, you get the same value, right? Because this k can be kind of written here, right? So um, why do we like one bit array? Because it's simpler. So this is what I wanted to say about um, Bloom filters. Are there any questions? Yes, go ahead. So how do you get a close form? Bound on the k. Well, how did he derive that uh, k is equal to? Uh, oh, how did I? How did I figure that out? Oh, you can just take the take the uh, take the equation, take the derivative. This will be the solution. Yeah, this is the yeah. Right, set it to zero. It's it's convex, so it's easy. But you could even do it numerically. Like I plotted this, I think, in MATLAB or whatever. Great. Anything else? Good. So this is uh, 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 the first algorithm we want to talk about. So now we will talk about our second uh, algorithm, which is about counting distinct elements in, the, in, in a stream. Um, and this is also uh, a very nice way of doing things. So the problem now is the following. You have a stream of items. And uh, you have, and this stream of items uh, contains elements from some set uh, universe uh, of size capital N. And what I want to maintain count of is the number of distinct elements or distinct items I have seen so far, right? And again, how how could I do this? I could have a dictionary, and I would be just memorize like throwing my elements into the dictionary. And at any at any point in time, I would ask, what's the size of my dictionary? But again, imagine I cannot do that. I don't have I don't have enough memory, right? So, if I cannot maintain a set of elements I've seen so far, uh, how would I still count how many distinct elements have I seen? What would be some applications of this, right? Um, you could ask how many different words have I f have I found among the web pages that I have crawled on a different on a given website, right? You could keep a hash table of all the words you've seen. Or you could try to do something small, something sm smaller, because the number of different websites is so huge, right? Um, or, right, you could ask how many different web pages does does each customer request in a week? 
And again, you cannot have um, a hash table now for every person uh, who's browsing the web to, to keep track of what they have seen in a given week, right? Or, right, how many distinct products have we sold uh, last week? Again, you could have a hash table of all the products, but maybe you do this for every region or for every, for every uh, market uh, that you have. Uh, again, you cannot store everything in memory. So can the methods that we talk about now, can they help? Right, so the idea will be I, the amount of storage I can afford myself is small. So the problem is, what do we do if we don't have space to maintain a set of all the elements or items seen so far, right? And we wanna estimate the count in an unbiased way, but we accept the count if it has a little error, but we would like to limit the probability that the error will be very large, okay? And the method is called Flajolet martin um, and here is how it goes. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, algorithm that, that does this and it's kind of surprising. So the idea is the following. Let's pick a hash function that maps each of the elements into a bit string of length log, uh, log base 2n, right? So if I have uh, n, if my universe of all elements coming that can come from the string, uh, from the stream is uh, size n, then I want a hash function that basically maps each of the elements into some, into some bit string, okay? And then the idea is the following, that for every element in the stream, I, I will first hash it, and then I will represent the hash value in binary, and I will ask how many, uh, how many z and, I and I will go from the right, and I will ask how many zeros are there before I see the first one. And this is what I will label as R of A. Right, A is an element from the stream. I take the A, I compute the hash code, I represent the hash code in binary, and then I go from the right and I keep counting how many zeros I see before I see a one, right? So for example, if I take an element from the stream, it mesh hashes to the hash value 12, I represent 12 as a binary string, I go from the right and I count how many steps do I take before I see a value of one, right? And because I have to take two steps, my R of A equals two, okay? So I'm just counting how long is the tail of zeros in the hash code of a given element, okay? And now, given that I've done this, what is my estimate? I will say, uh, let me now go and uh, compute the longest tail of zeros that I have seen in my stream so far, and then I'll say the, that, um, um, that my estimate on the number of distinct elements I've seen is two raised to the power of capital R. Okay, so what's the algorithm? The algorithm is elements come, I hash its element, I represent its hash code as binary, I see what is the tail of zeros that it has, what's the length of it, I keep doing that, you wake me up and say, Yure, how many different elements were there? I say, what's the longest tail of zeros I've seen? I will take two to that length of the tail, that is my, that is my answer to you. And uh, that will be a correct answer, almost always, all right? So this is, uh, this is the cool algorithm, and it's not clear why this should work, okay? So let me first give you kind of a rough intuition why this, why this works, all right? And this is kind of very rough, very heuristic, but it's a good intuition, okay? So, right, the idea is that eight, when you have a hash function, the the property of hash functions we exploit is that they kind of randomly hash into these uh, buckets or into these numbers, right? So A, uh, the function H hash, hashes A with equal probability to any of the N values, N integers, right? And then if you think about it, H of A is a sequence of uh, log N bits, right? And if you think about how many numbers from one to N have a, have a, sec have a tail of a given number uh, of a given length of zeros is that a to the uh, raised to the power of minus r is the fraction of all lm all entries all all numbers between one and n that have a tail of r zeros, right? So now, if you are thinking about picking a random hash function, this means that about half of the time you will see something that is you know some bit some bit and then you have a zero, right? About Half of the numbers are even and half are odd, right? So it, it will take you to see about, after about two, after you've seen about two numbers, you will see a tail of length one, right? 
And now you can make a similar argument, right? About quarter of all the all the elements hash to something that is, you know, something, something, zero, zero. So kind of you need to see about four elements from the stream before you can expect to see a tail of length two. Okay? And this is kind of the 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 the, the heuristic argument, right? Is that it takes you a certain time to see, you have to see a certain number of elements before you see a tail of a given length. And, and everything this, uh, um, uh, this uh, relies on is this idea that hashes, that hash function hashes uh, your elements into these uh, numbers one to n with equal probability that the hash function is random. So you need to wait a certain amount of time before you see a tail of a, diff of a given length of zeros, right? So it takes me about two to the r times or two to the r items before I see one that has a zero suffix uh, of length r. That's a heuristic argument. What I want to do now is actually give you a more precise argument. Okay, so why this works more formally? Um, are there any questions about what we said so far? So let's talk about more giving a more formal argument, right? Why does this Mar Martin Flajolet algorithm works? Formally, we will show the following thing. We will say that the probability of finding a tail of R zeros goes to one if I've seen the number of items that is greater than two, much greater than two to the R. And the probability of seeing a tail of, um, um, uh, le um, of R of R zeros goes to zero if the number of distinct elements we've seen so far is less than two to the R, right? So we will say if it's more, the the probability of seeing it goes to one, and if it's less, it goes to zero, where M is the number of distinct elements seen so far in the stream, right? So what this means is that th this value two to the capital R will almost always be around value of M. Right, because um, if it's uh, if uh, two to the r, if m is less than two to the r, uh, then the, with probability zero, I'm going to see that that uh, tail of that length, and uh, if m is more, I'm going to see that tail with probability one. Okay, so that's kind of the argument why this will why this will work. So now let me actually prove you these two these two bullets. Okay. So the question is, what is the probability that a given hash function, hash value h of a, ends with at least uh, r zeros, right? The probability of that is 2 raised to the power of minus r. Uh, the reason for that is because hash functions are randomly as taking the elements and assigning them to, no to numbers between 1 and n. So, um, you know, about, as I said before, half of the numbers are, are even, so there is half of the numbers will have a the tail of length one, about a quarter of length two, uh, about an eighth of length three, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So um, the probability that a random number ends in at least r zeros is two to the minus r. So that should be clear, right? And then, you know, what is the probability of not seeing a tail of length r among m distinct elements? Let's compute that. And the thing is the following, right? This is the probability of seeing a tail of length r. This is the probability of not seeing the tail of length r. Now we take m different elements, so we have to raise this to the power of m. And this is now the probability of not seeing the tail uh, of length r among the m distinct elements we've seen so far, right? So just this is probability that any given h of a ends with fewer than r zeros. And now this is out of all the distinct elements we've seen so far, all of them have fewer than r zeros, okay? And then I use the same uh, approximation that we used before, right? Here is my equation from uh, from the last slide. I will uh, 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 multiply or raise it to the power of two to the r, and then also uh, mul multiply it with the two to the r, uh, two to the minus r, so this thing would cancel out. And then again, by the same argument as we had before, this thing equals to e raised to the power of minus m raised to the power two to the r minus um, two to the uh, a two so two uh, raised to the power of minus r. I'm sorry. Okay. So now 
what is the probability of not finding a tail of lands minus r, right? And we need to analyze two cases. The first case is when the number of distinct elements we'll see m is much less than 2 to dr, right? Then what you want to show is the probability tends to r, uh, tends to 1. How do I show this? This is what we had on the last slide. By simplification above, this is just e raised to some power. And now, by, by, uh, by uh, this way, right, um, because uh, m is much, much less than 2 to the r, the ratio of m divided by 2 to the r goes to 0, right? So it means that e raised to the power uh, 0 uh, equals, uh, equals 1, right? So this is the argument why the probability of not seeing the length of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, a tail of r, uh, length r goes to 1 if m divided by 2 to the r goes to 0, which means m is much less than 2 to the r, right? And then similarly, what if m, the number of distinct elements, is much greater than 2 to the r? Then the same thing, but now 2 m divided by 2 to the r, this is infinite because m is much bigger. So if I insert this here, um, uh, what, what, this, what this will mean is that this will be e raised to the power of negative uh, something, so this thing will go to zero, right? So the probability of not seeing a tail of length r goes to zero if the number of distinct elements we've seen is greater than 2 to the r, right? And this means, right, that the 2 to the r will almost always be around the value of m, because if 2 to the r is, is greater than m, that happens with uh, 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 prob uh, probability one, and the 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 uh, if two to the r is much much smaller than m, that that happens with probability zero. So r has to be somewhere in between. Okay. So now, how does this work, right? If you would actually do the math, you would if you would want to compute the expected value of two to the r, you would figure out. That is that the expected value is infinite, right? So uh, the reason for that is that uh, the probability of seeing a length of a given uh, of a of a given uh, length um, uh, is halved at every time, but the value we predict doubles, right? It's um, if we go from two to the r to two to the r plus one. So the in ex if you compute this expectation, it will be infinite. What is the workaround? The workaround is that you don't only use one hash function, but you use multiple hash functions, right? You have multiple hash functions h sub a, so now you have multiple uh, samples or multiple instances of this longest tail of zeros that we found, r sub a, under the hash function h sub a, right? And now that you have multiple of these guys, how do you, how do you combine them? And there are two options you may want to say. One option would be, what if I take the average of these estimates coming out of uh, uh, um, uh, 2 to the r? And the problem would be is that if by some luck one of the r's is very large, that will take over your average and your estimate won't be good. And if you would say, I, I don't like that, let me take the median of 2 to the r values, the problem is that then your estimates are always a power of 2, which is kind of unsatisfactory and has relatively large error. So what the solution is, is that you partition your r sub i values into small groups. For every group, you take the median r sub i, and then you take the average of the, of the medians to compute your estimate. And the, the idea for doing this is that, you know, maybe under one hash function you are unlucky and you have a very long tail of zeros, right? But if, so, um, and if you uh, take the average uh, over two to the uh, two to two to the ri, then this unlucky big uh, ri would take over, and your average would be super big. And if you, as I said, if you take the median, then you are taking the median of value of values two to the r. So every 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 answer is a power of two. So the best way is to take your values r, split them into small groups. In every group, you take the median value of r, right? So that prevents you from taking one unlucky r that has a lot of zeros and, and uh, screwing over your estimate, and then you take the average of these estimates over the groups. And that works really well in practice. Are there any questions? Yes, great. Can you explain again why it's problematic for the medians 
Yeah. Great. Why is, yeah, why is, so you mean, why is this problematic? So this is problematic, right? So I use multiple hash functions. For every hash function, I'm saying, what is the longest tail of zeros that I have found, right? If I now say, uh, I have 100 hash functions, I have 100 values of R. Now, uh, my estimate is 2 raised to the, to the, to the R, right? So the problem is, if I take the median, then uh, out of all these values of R, I will take the middle one, and I will then uh, compute 2 to the R. So every answer I get is naturally a pow is a power of 2, because le number, uh, number of zeros is an integer, so I'm taking 2 and, uh, and powering it with an integer, right? So my, my overall estimate of the number of distinct items we'll get is only 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on, right? So I cannot give you a value of, of, of uh, 27, right? Because it has to be two to, the in, 2 to the power of an integer, right? What's the problem with taking the average? The problem with taking the average is that, you know, maybe there is one hash function that, that you were unlucky to select that takes the first element from the stream and it's, it hashes it to something with a lot of zeros. Right? And, and if we are looking for the longest tail of zeros, this means that this one lucky hash function will give you this huge value. So all the other hash functions don't really matter in this average. So your estimate will be way off. Right? So you want to kind of throw away this extreme random uh, event. And the way you do that is to take the median. And then you want to take the average so that you can give the answer that is not, that has resolution higher than two raised to some integer. That's again the idea. Thank you for asking. Great. Anyone else? Come on, people. Yes, great. OK, thank you. Uh, so is there like a formal derivation of how this fixes the issue of the infinite expectation? Is there a formal derivation? How does this fix the issue? Um, not that I would know. Uh, at least intuitively, right? Where does it, wh why does it, where, where do you get screwed? Uh, you get screwed, right? Because we said that you are going over. Uh, wow. Okay. Um, we say you go over, and you are looking for the longest, right? Out of all the all the tails that you've seen, you look for the longest tail, right? So you might be unlucky to see a very long tail of zeros, and that, and because you are taking the maximum over all the tails, you kind of want to be careful with that maximum, and taking the median allows you for that maximum to not kind of skew you too much, all right? That's maybe all I can say. I don't know of a formal uh, definition. It's a good question. Uh, good. So uh, making strong progress, uh, two out of four, three out of four. So this is now for computing moments, uh, right? The idea is the following. Imagine you have a stream of elements um, where elements are integers. Um, and let's, let, let's say the, um, m sub i be the number of times item i occurs in the stream. Then the case moment of the stream is defined as the sum over the elements, uh, uh, elements of the stream, number of times you've seen that item in the stream raised to the power of k. This is the same definition of the moment as you see the moment definition in statistics. Usually in statistics, you would center the moment. You would, you would subtract the mean. Here we don't center the moment, right? So I'm asked, basically, the thing is, I have a stream of items. For every item, I keep the count how often have I seen it. And then the moment uh, when I want to compute, let's say, the second moment of the stream, I take the item counts, raise them to the power k. In our, say, case k would be 2, and sum them up, right? So. Let me give you uh, special cases of this, right? The zeroth moment is the number of distinct elements. And this is the problem we just talked about. The first moment is simply uh, uh, counts the number of elements, right? It's, it's the length of the stream, right? Because for every um, I, uh, item type, I ask how often did it occur. If I sum up the number of occurrences of all the items, I get the length of the stream. So this is very easy to compute. What is maybe less easy to compute is then the second moment, which is what we call the surprise number. And it's a measure of how uneven distribution is, right? And then, of course, you could compute 
the third moment that is called the skew and would tell you if the distribution of your items is more skewed to the left or it's more skewed to the right. And then, you know, the fourth, the fourth moment you, is called kurtosis and so on and so forth, right? So let me now give you an idea what does the second moment do and why do we call it a surprise number, right? Imagine I have a stream of 100 uh, elements and uh, the stream takes 11 distinct uh, values or 11 dis different items appear in the stream. So then I could say, what are the counts of my items, right? I could see item number one 10 times and number number item number two, two uh, nine times and you know, item number 10, uh, nine times as well, right? So then if I would compute the second moment of the stream, it would be 10 squared plus nine squared plus nine squared and so on, the value would be 910. Right? Now if I had, take the same stream of length 100 with 11 distinct items, but the item number one appears 90 times and all the items, all the other items appear one time, and I compute the second moment of the stream, the second moment would be 8,110. Right? So what's the point? The point is here the stream, on the top the stream is very even, the distribution is very even. So, you know, if you want the, um, the entropy is very high, so I get or the distribution is very even, I get a very low surprise number. And here, the distribution of count is very uneven, right? This is a super popular item and other items don't occur at all. Then the, the distribution is very uneven, so the surprise number is very high, okay? That's the idea. So what I wanna do is I wanna be able to compute this surprise number for a given stream without the need to maintain a hash table of counts of the occurrences of the item. That's the hope, all right? The method we'll talk about, it's called the, the AMS method named by the, by the authors uh, who have proposed this. And this method gives us an unbiased estimate of a given moment. Um, and we, we will be, for this analysis, we'll only focus on the second moment, but this can work for other, for moments of uh, higher order, so third and fourth uh, as well. The idea is the following, is that we will keep track of many random variables x, where a random variable x stores two things. It stores the element and it stores the value. The element corresponds to the item, let's call it i, and value corresponds to the count m, m sub i of that value i, okay? Um, and note that this, requ that this requires that we basically say we will take this uh, element and we will count how often, how often it occurs uh, in the stream. But the point is that the number of these x's that we want to instantiate is relatively limited. And then our goal is to compute this surprise number s that is a sum over all the distinct items that appear in the stream value, uh, how often they appeared in the stream so far, squared, summed together, okay? And of course, if I could initialize a different random variable x for every distinct uh, element of the stream, every distinct item of the stream, then computing this would be trivial. But I don't want to do that, okay? I cannot say for every corresponding item, I will keep a count. I cannot allow that, okay? So uh, the question is, how do I set this value and uh, uh, so the count and the element for this random variable x? For now, let's assume that we know the stream has length n. We know that in the stream, um, we will read n elements of the stream. And the idea is the following. Let's pick some random time t um, at which we will start uh, we, at which we will an initialize our random variable x. Um, and let's pick this t to be un kind of picked uniformly at random from the beginning to the end of the stream, right? Right now we are assuming fi finite stream of length n, right? And whatever is the time we, we, we decided, at that time, you know, we get to see some item coming from the stream. So we initialize x to, to, to be the, uh, to, to, to that item uh, i. And then we simply maintain the count C to be the number of times we've seen this item I from time T to the end of the stream. Okay, so saying again, 
I have a finite stream of length n. Uh, I pick a random time point t in this stream. This is when I wake up. I look at look what is the element I've just uh, that is at position t. That's when I initialize my random variable x. And from then on to the end of the stream, I simply count how often have I seen this item i that appeared at position t. Okay, that's what I do. And now, what is my estimate of the second moment? My estimate of the second moment is n, which is the length of the stream, times 2 times c, which is the number of times I've seen the item uh, i appear in the stream, minus 1. Okay? And uh, of course, this is estimate for one random variable. In reality, I will keep multiple of these random variables, um, and then my final true estimate will be the average estimate over the k random variables that I have kept. Okay? Um, so this is what the algorithm is, right? So the idea is that I have a stream, I wake up at a random time, I initialize x, I remember what is the item that is at, uh, uh, that I see at that time, and then I simply keep counting that item, uh, the, current, the number of occurrences of that item i from that point t to the end of the stream onward. And at the end of the stream, I simply say the surprise number is two times uh, the number of times I've seen this, that item minus one multiplied by n. This is for one random variable x. Because I have multiple, I compute multiple of these estimates and take the average. Okay? So that's the algorithm. Uh, are there any questions mechanistically about this thing? All good? Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to prove why this works. Okay? So here is how we'll prove that this, that this works, right? Imagine the following. Imagine I have a stream, and for now, let's say my stream only has uh, uh, items uh, A and B. So only two types of items appear in my stream, right? So my stream starts at the beginning and you know goes to the end. And then, right, I'm counting how often have I seen item of type A, how often have I seen the item of type B, right? And then I will, de I will denote by, uh, sorry, here, uh, m sub a to be the number of times item a appears in the entire stream from the beginning to the end, right? And then, you know, what I want to compute is I want to compute this second moment, which is the sum of the, of the counts squared, right? So now, one way how I can think of this is I can say c sub t is the number of times item at time t appears from time t onward, right? So the idea is the following, right? Like, so for example, um, if I would say, what is C1, uh, what is C1, right? C1 equals M sub A. Why is that? Because I'm saying item at time one is A, and I'm asking how often does item at position one appear to the end of the stream? It appears M sub A times, right? If I say, what is C sub 2? That's how often does item at position number 2 appear towards from there on to the end of the stream. It appears however often it appears in the entire stream minus 1 because to the left of it is the same item, right? And then, you know, C3 is M sub B. Again, why? Because position, the, the item at position 3 is, uh, is B, and from there on, B appears m sub b times, okay? So that's, that's my notation. Um, and now, using this, let's, let's uh, write out what is our estimate. We say that our estimate into the, uh, the expectation over f of x, which is x is the random variable, and f is our function that gives us the estimate, uh, f of x is this expression. But now, because we sample uh, t at t, uh, the, the time at which we start counting at random, this is simply 1 over n, a sum over all the times from 1 to n, when n is the length of the stream. And then for any, for any of the times, here is our estimate in the uh, surprise number of the stream, right? It is length of the stream times 2 times c sub t, right? Where c sub t is the count of the number of times the item at position t appears from there on to the end of the stream. That is, right here I define what C sub t is, okay? 
So let's see and now try to compute what is this expectation, right? We would want this expectation to be equal to the surprise number up there. So our goal is to take this equation and massage it to, to something that looks like uh, sum over i uh, n sub i squared, okay? Notice that this summation goes over the times. It goes over the elements of the stream um, because we are picking the random, the, the time t at random, any time t is equally likely. So I'm saying over all possible times, what is the, est what is the, what is the estimate uh, in the surprise number we get? And here is the key step in this derivation, is that this summation here counts over the time of the stream, while this summation here counts over the items of the stream. So the way to think of this is the following. What I'm doing here is I'm really going and saying, for the time number one, how often do I see item at position one to the end of the stream? At time number two, how often do I see uh, item at position two to the end of the stream? And here I rearrange the summation so that now I'm counting over distinct items in the stream. And then for every item, right, there is, I, I, you can think of it when I first see that item, that item will appear m sub i times. So this is, this is that expression. Then, right, and, and so on. And when I last see the item, the, the, that item is going to, to appear one times two times one, only once left, right? So what this is really doing, I'm saying how I'm kind of looking at this expression for every occurrence of the item, right? When I first see the item, I get, 2m sub i minus 1. When I see the item, uh, this is the third time before the end, it's 2 times 3 minus 1 is 5. When I see the item the second time before the end of the stream, like counting backwards, I'll get 2 times 2 minus 1, I get a 3. And when I see the item for the last, last time in the stream, I get 2 times 1 minus 1, I get a 1. Okay? So the point here is that I'm grouping these values not by time, but by item they belong to, okay? And then the way I think of this is, this is the time t when the item i is seen last, right? And then, you know, this is the time when item i is seen for the penultimate time, right? And, you know, this is the time when item i is seen for the first time, right? Where c sub t equals m sub i, and then if I insert m sub i in here, I get 2m sub i minus 1. This is how we did the rearrangement. So now I'll go to the next slide where I will copy this equation over. Okay? So what we just computed is that expectation over, over f of x, our, over our estimate is a sum, 1 over n. But the sum now goes over all the different item types, n times, and then it's 1 plus 3 plus 5 all the way to 2m i minus 1. Okay? So now let's try to compute what does this sum add up to. And the way to uh, write out this sum is to say, aha, uh -huh, the sum we have there goes from 1 to m sub i, and then I'm summing up 2 times i minus 1, right? 1 is uh, 2 times 1 minus 1, 3 is 2 times 2 minus 1, 5 is 2 times 3 minus 1, and so on, right? Um, and this summation, what is it? Is it is 2 times m sub i uh, times m sub i plus 1 divided by 2, okay? So this is what this summation adds, uh, adds, uh, adds up to. And if I now cancel out the, the 2s and I multiply m inside, um, I get, um, I get uh, m squared plus m, and here I have a, a minus m, so that cancels as well. So what is left is m sub i squared, okay? And uh, what this means, this means that expectation over f of x equals 1 over n, sum over i, n times m i squared, right? And now the, the n's will cancel out. So all I'm left with is that the expectation of f of x is a sum over i, uh, m sub i squared, which is, exactly what we want, right? This means that when we initialize this random variable x, uh, count the number of, uh, number of times item i occurred to the end of the stream, 
compute that value of f of x, which is um, which I gave you on the previous slide, then in expectation that value has uh, has uh, um, the expected value of that of that thing is exactly the surprise number. So it's exactly what we want. Okay. So we have a second moment in expectation. So on average, we will get the second moment. Yes. Can we define the f of x? Was it uh, essentially so that it worked out this way, or was there other intuition for why it was n times times c? Great. Why did we define this f of x in this magic way? Uh, here is why, right? So I'll try to explain it. So for estimating the kth moment, we we will essentially need to use the same algorithm as I gave you. We will just define f of x differently. Our definition of f of x was that this is n times 2c minus 1. If you want to estimate the third moment, you, you define f of x differently. You define it as n times 3 times c squared minus 3c plus 1. Okay? And this may, so I mean, initializing my random variables in the same way, but I'm uh, initializing, uh, but I'm computing f of x in a different way. So now, why, like where, you know, where did I pull these numbers off, right? So here is what you need to remember, like going to your question, right? You have to remember that when I was computing my expectation, I had this summation, 1 plus 3 plus 5, all the way to 2m sub i minus 1. So we all followed where did I get this. And what we showed is that these terms, 2c, um, uh, minus one sum up to m squared, right? What our goal was to show that this summation, right, over uh, over uh, uh, over all the all the uh, uh, over all the uh, uh, terms c from one to m, so basically this summation sums up to m squared. That's what we showed, and the way. The way you show this, right, is that you distribute the sum inside, and this is really two times the sum over c minus the sum over c of one. So here you get the um, the the uh, the uh, you get the uh, you get the uh, m sub i as we had before, and here you get m sub i uh, two times uh, you get m sub i squared, and then the things cancel out, and what is left is m squared, right? So now what about for the value? Uh, of uh, of um, uh, uh, k equals three, we need the same thing. We need right that whatever we take here and and sum it together, it has to sum up to m raised to the to the power of three. And the way I I compute that is to say the the what I really want is I want c cubed minus c minus one cubed. This is this is these are this is my estimate. This is what I want, so that these c's cancel out each other as I do the sum, so that only the biggest guy survives, right? And if I compute this thing, then what is what is what is left is is here, and this is exactly my estimate, right? So really, what I want is that the the sum of these estimates kind of adds up to either m squared or n cubed, um, and the way I can Write this out right here. I re I wrote this as a sum over um, c squared minus a sum over uh, c minus one squared. And if I do this right, then basically here everything will cancel except the the last the last element uh, when c will be m. So that's why this survives, right? Um, and that's how I got here. That's how I got it. And in generally, if I wanna the, the estimate the case moment, then this is the formula to estimate the case moment. It's c raised to the power k minus c minus 1 raised to the power of k, right? Because I want these things to cancel out so that only the last c to the k when c equals m survives. That's the intuition uh, why this happens. Now, what, what is there to say is how do we com com combine samples? Right now, we did everything by assuming the stream has the fixed length. But um, what if I, uh, so, and we have instantiated a single x. If I want multiple x's, then I would create multiple uh, random variables x. I would now average them in groups and then take the median of the average. That turns out the best in practice. There is one more thing we need to fix. 
And the thing we need to fix is that we assume that the stream has a fixed length. But in reality, strings never end. So what we need to do is we assumed that we have a number n of the elements in the stream, so the length of the stream. But as I said, real streams have infinite length. So I don't know what will be the, the number of inputs uh, or elements that I will see in the stream. So how do we solve this? The way we solve this is that we have this variable x, but we also keep a counter n that tells me how many, how many items, how many elements have we read, uh, have we read uh, uh, from the stream. And then what we need to be able to do is, from whatever is the length of the stream we've seen so far, uh, we must uh, figure out how to sample uh, uh, positions t uniformly at random out of this stream, right? So what this means is that we could, if we can only store k counts as this uh, access, this k random variables x, we will want to throw some random variables out and instantiate the new ones, right? So the objective that we really want is that uh, uh, that any starting time t is selected with equal probability, right? That after we have seen n, n elements or n tuples from the stream, each starting time t is selected with probability k over n if we want to have k random variables kept in, um, uh, uh, kept in memory, right? And hopefully this now rings a bit of a bell. And the, what, what, what this really means is, this is really that we need to be able to sample uniformly, um, right? We want to create a fixed size sample of, a, of an infinite stream, of a stream that where n is increasing as we read more elements. And last time, we talked about the method to do this, and the method is called uh, reservoir sampling, right? So the solution here is to do fixed size sampling, right? Where the idea is that first you choose the first k random variables uh, from the first k items you sampled from the stream. And then from there on, whenever a new, you read a new element from the stream, you, uh, you keep, uh, you keep that element, uh, that reading, that value with probability k over n. If you decide to keep it, you throw one of the existing x's out and initialize a new x and start counting that element from there on. And then at any point in time, you are able to compute the surprise number by using my estimate f of x that we have derived before. So this is what I wanted to say about number, uh, uh, the algorithm number three, computing the surprise number. You have a question? No question? Any questions? So what all the magic here was is that we had this estimate that when we computed the estimate over it, Essentially, it allow, kind of it allows us to create this telescopic sum, and everything would cancel out except the count of that item squared would survive. And that was the, the big insight here, right? Uh, where kind of randomness and being able to uniformly sample from the stream helped us a lot. This is kind of the intuition here. Good. Any, any questions? Good, so let me now try to see, uh, I'll, I'll cover this thing, I probably won't get to the end, but this is also something that is very useful. So I think out of this lecture, the bloom filters are amazingly useful in everyday life, and the next topic is also amazingly useful in everyday life, okay? So here is what I would like to do. I would like to do item set counting, think of frequent item sets, but I wanna do this on a stream, right? So given a stream, I want to ask what items appear more than s times in the window, right? Um, and one way how I could solve this is that I could use the, uh, I could represent stream um, uh, of, let's say, baskets as a binary stream per item. This is how I finished the last lecture. And then I say, right, I am a supermarket. Each basket contains a set of items, and I have this multiple streams, one per item, and whenever a new basket comes, I emit a vector of zeros and ones that tells whether a given item is in the stream, uh, is in the basket or not, right? And then <coughs> I could use the DGIM method to estimate the, the counts of ones uh, of all the items 
across all the baskets. And this would kind of tell me how many, how many times, how many times have I sold an individual item across the last k baskets? Okay? So here is now, if I want not only the counts of individual items, but I want more, right? How could I now count frequent pairs? Right? How could I count what pairs of items have sold many times? Right? So I could have one string per a pair of items. And then the number of streams I would have would be quadratic in the number of items. And uh, that, you know, the, the number of streams now would be way too big and I really couldn't do this. And also the answers I would get would be approximate. So I don't want to do that. So here is what I would want to do. So the idea that is super useful is this notion of exponentially decaying windows. And the idea is, and this is the, really a, a heuristic that kind of allows you to keep frequency of an item over time, and that frequency can kind of decay over time if you haven't seen that item repeatedly. And the idea is, is in some sense, if you ask, what are currently popular movies, right? Where instead of computing the row count over the last n elements, or you know, what are the the, the you know the most popular celebrities on Twitter today, you wouldn't say, oh, what are the what are the follower counts they obtained in a given day? But you want to use some kind of smooth aggregation, where uh, kind of uh, getting a follow right now is more important than getting a follow seven hours later, right? So we want to have some kind of smooth aggregation of item appearances over the entire stream. And the way you achieve this is the following, right? Imagine you have a stream of items and we are taking the sum of the stream. But then rather than taking the sum, what you do is you say, I'll take the sum over the entries as I read them. I take the value, but I will multiply it with this one minus C raised to the power of T minus I, right? Where basically um, I is the, is the item, is the, is the current time, and T is the length of the stream. And this means that the, that the, um, um, that the items closer to the beginning of the stream will count more than the items very far, right? And the idea for this is that C will be a very small constant. So it means that this will be like 0.99 something. So as you raise it to a big power, it will decay to zero. So it means that the, that the earlier counts will kind of count more than the counts later on. And this is the idea of exponentially, um, uh, exponentially decaying windows. And how do you really implement this is the following. When a new item arrives, you multiply uh, the current count of it by one minus C and then add that value. Okay, so the idea is that you kind of multiply by this discounting factor that is, I know, around 0 0.9, 0 0.99, and then add the value. And of course, um, this will now mean that this counts will kind of decay to zero if you haven't seen the item for a very long time. So let me give you an example now. Um, I still have some time, right? So let's say that each item A sub, a sub i is an item and we can compute a characteristic function of it, which basically means that for every possible item x, I have this exponentially decaying window. So the idea will be the following. Whenever an, uh, this uh, characteristic function of a given item will be the following, I'm basically saying, let me sum over the, all the entries in the stream. Uh, delta sub i returns value of one if, the, if at that position i, the item I see equals x, and otherwise it's zero, right? And then I'm multiplying this with one minus c, t minus i. So what this means is that imagine that for each item x, we have a binary stream where essentially one means that the item X appears at that position and zero means that the item X did not appear at that position. So then what do I need to do is when new item X arrives, I'll multiply counts of all items by one minus C. So think of this as 0.99. And then I add a count plus one to the element X, right? So now the idea is, right, items arrive at every step I multiply the counts of all items with 0.99, so they get a bit smaller. Only the item that really arrived gets the increase in the count, right? And this way that these items who I've seen in the past 
their counts will decrease exponentially with time because at every time they get multiplied by 0.99. So they, that count will quickly go to zero and only the items that appear, they will get a boost in their count, right? So we call this sum to be the weight of an item, right? So this weight will exponentially decay with time and whenever the item appears, it will get a boost of one. And that's the, that's the cool idea. And why is this useful? This is useful because this type of exponentially decaying windows have a, an important property. And the property is the following, is that you can compute what is the sum of, of uh, these decaying weights as a function of t. And if, you, if t goes from zero to infinity, then this sum of one minus c raised to the power t um, actually equals one over c. The way you can compute this is that there is a well-known uh, uh, formula for how do you compute the, the sum uh, of the values z raised to the power of k where you sum over k. Here's the thing, if you insert it, you get one over c. So what does this mean? It means that if you wanna ask, what are the currently popular movies? Um, you could say, I wanna find movies whose weight, whose this kind of characteristic function is more than one half. We can actually compute because we know that the sum over the whole weights is one over C. We know that uh, only about two over C movies will have the count of, or the weight of one half or more. So this means that I can set a threshold and based on the value of C, the discount factor of C I'm using, and the threshold, I can actually estimate ahead of time how many items do I expect to have the value higher than that. And this now allows me, in some sense, to keep a, a limited amount or limited count of items in the stream, uh, in, the, in the memory, where I'm basically keeping their counts and I'm multiplying these counts with the discount factor one, min uh, one, one minus C. And then if the discount fact, if the, if their total weight drops below my threshold, I throw them out. Otherwise I keep them in. And if I throw something out, I initialize the new one. And this means that I can always kind of keep in memory the most popular items by basically having a threshold on this exponentially decayed count. Um, this is essentially the idea here. I will stop here because I'm out of time, but, uh, Thank you everyone for coming. Don't forget for the 341 session next week. Um, thank you and see you next week.